Hi everyone, welcome to Church Online. Happy Sabbath everyone. Eli is cold today, that's why he's at home as a snack, as a bug, as a rug. Where's mine? Thank you. And now it's time for prayer. Good to see you all and we've, we've just got a, a message for, for our church family out there. We've got uh, those joining us from all around South Australia. Uh, but we're the, we're the group, they, well not the group, we're a group that have come together and have found prayer is very important. As my mum says, more prayer, more power. And, and so we meet up on Tuesdays and it's not just us, it's whoever would like to come. Uh, so we can lift up our church, we can uh, encourage one another, and we can go forward in the mission and ministry that God's called us to uh, with power through prayer. And so we've got some words of encouragement to share with our church. And we're going to start with Lindy, who on my screen is down there, but knowing when you record Zoom, she's probably all over the place. So we're going to hand it over to Lindy to encourage us first. Thanks, Pastor Devon. I'm really passionate about prayer. Growing up in the Adventist church, I discovered that when I joined a prayer group and had prayer partners, the one thing that changed the most was me. I started to change and God was able to work through me more. And so I'm passionate that every single member of South Australian Seventh Adventist churches has a prayer partner and belongs to a prayer group. Now, I know some people aren't comfortable praying out loud, but that doesn't matter. You can still be there praying quietly to yourself and, and linking arms with each other and praying for each other. That text in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, if my people, that's, that's a if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayers made in this place. As we come together as a group and pray with each other, we develop this love and care for each other that we wouldn't normally have. And as we pray and intercede, we even, even um, research has shown that prayer makes a difference for other people. So I really would like to encourage every person to get a prayer partner and join a prayer group and to do it through Zoom. We can sit here in our lounge rooms or here at Ankara or wherever we are and join together like this. It's fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm up here at the Riverland and you can see the beautiful River Murray behind me <laughs> and the, the palm trees in the background. It's a great place to be. But uh, like all other places, prayer meetings seem to be something that are uh, not really attended that greatly by a lot of people. And I know that when we had our churches running face to face, uh, people would attend a prayer meeting. Uh, they were a big group to start with and then they sort of peter off and you know, some of the reasons are, well, you know, it's too far to go, it's too cold to come out, it's too hot, it's uh, whatever the case may be. And yet COVID-19, as bad as it is, has given us some new avenues in which way we can actually communicate with one another without having to leave our homes. And for those of us who know how to use Zoom, and I'd encourage you to uh, find out how to use Zoom, prayer meetings are a essential way, I believe, that we should get together and uh, communicate and have prayer. It should be a church prayer meeting, it shouldn't just be one or two people. We can, as uh, Lindy said, we, we can sit in our comfort of our homes, uh, have our fires going, we can be sitting there looking at the screen, we can be smiling with people, we can be talking with people. You don't have to leave home, you don't have to travel, it doesn't cost you anything. And it's a wonderful way that we can come together and communicate. And I believe that mm. the Lord has been able to give this to us. Like it said, out of bad things, God can make good things. And I believe Zoom is one of those good things that he's given us. If you run across to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Look, I can't emphasize that enough. We need to pray more and more and more as uh, things go on. Uh, even though we are the people of the book, there are times that we are uncertain of what's going on. There are times that we have fears in our own heart. 
And the, the devil knows that the best way to destroy people is when we're by ourselves. But when we come together, when we talk about our problems, when we pray about our problems, when we pray about other people's problems, right, then things just work absolutely wonderful and we're, we're reinforced, our faith is stronger and we can go forward in the, in the Lord's. So I would encourage you, come together on prayer meetings, get onto Zoom. You don't have to pray like Lindy said, you can just listen there, bow your head, pray quietly to the Lord uh, while other people are praying as well. He accepts all kinds of prayers and from all kinds of people at any time, any day of night. So give it a go. I'd encourage you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say what the others have said. It's really a blessing to be able to come together and to spend time to pray for each other and to encourage each other and, and to... Um, yeah, just to be those things. And I like, like Pastor Andy, is, he's in Ephesians. Well, I was in Ephesians as well, and Ephesians chapter 3. And it says, Now to him who is able to do immensely more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. What a power we can tap into when we get together and pray. I encourage you to come and join a Zoom meeting and have prayer. Yeah, I just wanted to share, and don't mind that my volume's coming through Lindy and Gwen's picture. We're right next to each other. Um, I just wanted to share that, like for me, prayer just means so much and has done for me since I was a kid, because it's something that, it's like a best friend. Yeah, I can talk to God whenever, wherever. Um, I don't have to do it out loud. I can just do it in my mind. I can, I don't have to put it into words. I can just think the thoughts or I, sometimes it's just think the emotions and communicate with God. You know, I can have that conversation with him and there's just a peace that comes when you can just let everything out and leave it with God and know that no matter what happens, he's got this. You know, he's bigger than whatever else is going on in our lives. And, you know, he wants the best for us. He cares about us so much. And sometimes we think we have to come up with the answers, but often it's, it shouldn't come from us because we're going to get it wrong anyway. You know, it comes from God. And prayer is a way of being able to, to share with God where we're at. And then he can share back with us. And we may not get an answer straight away but we can know that he's working behind the scenes and often teaching us along the way. So when the answer comes, we learn so much more from it and we grow so much more from it. And I think the other benefit is that um, for me personally, prayer has been a big part of my spiritual growth. Um, between that and reading the Bible um, and sharing with um, people that have strong Christian faith, those three elements have really made a difference in my spiritual life. So I strongly encourage you to, even if you're not comfortable with praying out loud, at least have a conversation with God in your mind and speak to him that way. It, the benefits are very surprising at times. So give it a go. Uh, Father, we, we've spoken together as a group already and, and you know the, the petitions that we have had on our heart and the list of things that have come before us uh, that we have handed over to you. And like Andy said tonight, that uh, yeah, sometimes there's so many bad things and so many things that we need healing for uh, that, that it seems low and it seems dark. And we must not ever forget that the, the promise through all of this is that you say that you are with us. So we just pray that we may be able to experience your presence uh, we may know that you're with us, but sometimes we, we neglect to understand what that, that fully means, what security that brings. Mm. And so, Lord, instead of focusing on the, the uncertainties, uh, we want to celebrate the certainty that we have in a God who loves and cares for us, one who knows what tomorrow holds, the one who holds our hand here right now today. And so uh, all the things that we have asked, I just pray that we may have the patience to, to wait upon your answer and the faith to be able to trust that you are in control and that we are being faithful and following according to your will. Uh, for the Grove family and the Sabbath that we are going to, we are enjoying together, 
Uh, Lord, we just thank you that we, you have kept us safe throughout this COVID issue. But also we just pray for a vision that when we come out of this, and we know, may not run back to the norms, Lord, but we may look for opportunities to uh, share the, about the God that has kept us safe during this time. Share the certainty that we have and that you are coming again and the blessing that we have in experiencing you today. So mm -hmm. I thank you for all these things. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know the plans I have in store, you whisper in my ear. Words of affirmation, things I need to hear. But of all the things you planned for me, I never would have guessed that bringing me right here is what you call your best. But here I am in this unexpected place, a place I did not ask for, but one that's filled with grace. And here I am in this room I did not plan.
We give because God first gave us the most incredible gift anyone could ever give. He gave us His Son to save us all. We give because God continues to give to us every day, showering us with innumerable blessings. But in this crazy world we live in, sometimes it's hard to give. Maybe you're on holidays. Maybe you hate carrying cash. Maybe you didn't have time to go to an ATM after work. Maybe you spent too much during the week. Whatever the reason, life just sometimes manages to get in the way of our desire to give. But there is an easier way. There's a way to make giving a priority that allows you to be intentional and is also really convenient. It's e-giving. E-giving allows you the freedom to give at a time and place and in a way that is convenient for you. You can even set up weekly or monthly deductions to ensure that giving remains a priority in your life. So why not give e-giving a try? Visit e-giving and start giving the easy way. week is about the Israelites. They have just finished wandering the desert. They are about to enter the promised land. However, Moses is not allowed to join them. So God and Moses has to prepare the Israelites for when Moses needs to leave. Our message is we worship God when we choose to obey him. God has given us an entire Bible full of instructions and stories to help us live our lives. And it's our choice whether we choose to follow it. Our memory verse comes from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 13. Let's check that out together. Deuteronomy 11, 13. Love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart. So the Ten Commandments was given to Moses by God. But when Jesus was on earth, he was asked which commandment is the greatest. Now if you actually have a look in your Bibles to Matthew and if you look at Matthew chapter 22 start at verse 36 and read down to verse 40 you will see what Jesus replied. Hi everyone it's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called Words to Remember The memory verse is from Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13. It says, Love the Lord your God and serve Him with all your heart. Today's message is we worship God when we choose to obey Him. Do your parents ever say things like, Don't forget to take out the trash? Or, don't forget to feed the dog. They are reminding you to obey. The children of Israel were about to enter the promised land without Moses. What would he say to them? Moses looks longingly out over the Jordan River into the promised land. He is sad because he won't be going there. He pleads with God to let him enter that land with the people. But God says to Moses, Speak no more of this. You may view the land, but you may not enter it. So Moses doesn't ask about it anymore. He accepts God's wisdom and will. But now Moses thinks about the children of Israel. Who is going to lead them if he can't? Who is going to care about them? He prays and asks God to provide a good leader. God tells Moses that Joshua will lead the people. Joshua has worked beside Moses since Aaron died. Moses knows Joshua is a man of wisdom and faith, so Moses is happy with God's choice. God has one last thing for Moses to do. 
Many years have gone by since the people first heard the Ten Commandments at Sinai. Most adults living now were small children then or hadn't even been born. They could not have understood what was happening at Sinai. Few of them were old enough to know what it meant. So God tells Moses to proclaim these laws once more. God wants His people to follow His law as they settle into their new land. And so Moses calls the people together. Moses' face is lit up with a holy light. His clear and wise eyes look out over the thousands of people standing before him. These are his last words to them. With much emotion, he begins repeating their history. They had been slaves in Egypt, and God had rescued them. He reminds them of the great miracles God had performed for them. He tells how they had escaped through the Red Sea. And during all their travels, God had provided food and water. He had guided them by a pillar of fire and cloud. He tells them of the sins of their parents who had grumbled, complained, and worshipped idols. He reminds them of their travel in the desert for 40 years before they could go into Canaan. Moses also talks of the great patience and love of God toward them, of His forgiveness and grace. Moses tells them that the rules God has given them are wiser than all the rules of the other nations. They are to be an example of God's wisdom. They are to care for the other nations. They are told of the wonderful things awaiting them in Canaan. Then Moses goes over the laws with them again. He is still afraid that they will forget and stray away from God. So he reminds them of the wonderful blessings that will be theirs if they obey God. He tells of the blessings of food, happy families, good leaders, and protection against enemies. But Moses also tells of the curses of losing their land if they disobey. They will have no peace or safety, and they will live in fear and sorrow and with diseases. Then Moses closes with a song. You can read it in Deuteronomy 32. It tells of the wonderful way God had shown His love in the past, and it tells of future events and the final victory of Christ's second coming. Moses says, Command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words. They are your life. The people are to memorize this song, to teach it to their children. They are to remember it always. It will help them remember what God has done for them. After this, Moses climbed Mount Nebo in the land of Moab. There he looked one more time into the promised land. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. All right, thank you so much for listening. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Um, and so let's close our eyes, bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you have given us the Bible so that we know how to live. Please be with us. Help us to make the right decisions. In your name, amen. All right, thank you so much. See ya, bye. Keep walking on There's something up ahead Water falling like a song An everlasting stream The river carries me home Let it flow, let it flow oh, Soul, a well that never will run dry. I've rambled on my own, never believing I would find. 
good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Welcome, I'm just going to do a welcome to our Grove family and happy Sabbath. Uh, it's good to have you and thank you for joining us here online uh, today. Uh, I'm introducing one of my good friends. We worked in the youth department together uh, way back in the day and now he's over in the States. So it's now about 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock over here um, in Adelaide and it's about, what's the time over there? Yeah, it's 5.18 p.m. Yeah, so as you can see, it's, it's dark, but I've got every light on in the house, but there's sunshine beaming through his window. The, the good thing about this, this experience that we're going through, I know that a lot of our church members have mentioned, and it's natural for all of us. God made us for community, and we can't wait to come together and see people in the flesh. But while we are apart, we have this opportunity to encourage one another from around the world even, and to see that we're not only in this by ourselves, but we are part of a worldwide movement, a worldwide mission. Uh, the struggles that we face are uh, struggles that are shared uh, throughout the rest of our churches and uh, other places, and also the blessings that we get to share in understanding or exploring uh, the next step and what church movement should look like. Uh, we can share that as well with our friends that are around the world. So uh, I've invited uh, Pastor Joseph Cabez to be part of our service and to bless us today. 
Um, Joseph, uh, how's things going over over in your ways, um, especially with your family or just living in America? And, uh, where do you live? What do you do? How old are you? If you want to share that. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Pastor Strickland. It's great to be with you, and I really enjoyed catching up with you during our youth director meetings that we would have back in Australia. And it's great that we can still do ministry from a distance together as well. Um, so I'm currently right now in, uh, at Southern Adventist University in Tennessee. Um, and here it's a campus of about 2,500 students and, and faculty and staff. And so um, we've been here. It was a transition for me because I was at a local church here in Maryland. And then we just transitioned to Tennessee back in October. So it's, it's been interesting going from, uh, from pastoring to, to education, which is a little different uh, on at least an educational setting here. But we've been good so far. Um, <laughs> some things that have been interesting has been uh, getting used to not being close to a beach uh, nearby. I've always lived, you know, Brisbane and Sydney and Australia. So I've never been more than 20 minutes away from a beach, but here, um, it's more like lakes or creeks and things like that. So adjusting to that, but the people have been very warm and encouraging here. And um, what's interesting, I'm back at Southern, and this is where I met my wife here on campus. My uncle actually taught her a Bible class and he baptized her. So um, we're back to where it started and where we first met. So that, that was pretty cool. And what was interesting, uh, Pastor Strickland, just two, just two weeks ago, I saw two snakes in my backyard in Tennessee and I've never seen a snake in my backyard in Australia. And so I'm like, <laughs> what, what's going on? I thought I didn't realize that they had snakes down here. Apparently they have 38, 34 or 38 different types of snakes in Tennessee. And I met two of them last week. Yeah, actually I, I recall the, the last worship uh, I, I heard you share and this was at I first all, all those years ago. Uh, that you had some condition about cuteness when, when you met your wife. Uh, do you remember sharing that? Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's correct. <laughs> you remember too. Yeah, no, there's there's an actual uh, term for it called cute aggression. And um, some people, I don't know if your church members that are watching online can relate, but, uh, uh, you know, there is um, this condition where you see something um, cute, maybe a baby that's chubby and you just want to, you feel like maybe even like biting them, you just want to squash them. And I always got to be careful around my wife because I find her cute, but she's like, Hey, don't, don't, <laughs> don't squeeze me too hard. And so um, I, I've, I've learned, tried to learn my lesson every time I'm around her or around my two nieces uh, back in Australia when I see them, you know, uh, just this thing called cute aggression. Oh, we we gotta gotta check that out. And I, I think a few of our grandmothers might have it, but I yeah. haven't heard of anyone as as young as you having. Pray for us. Questions. Pray for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, in, in your ministry over there, uh, uh, what are some of the challenges that you guys have faced uh, over this time? Is, well, we've got restrictions here. Um, we're allowed to come. We're, we're looking into coming back together, but uh, again, it's under conditions. We got to have four square meter rules. Uh, hand cleansing cleaners after each event, um, a distance of one and a half meters, and a certain amount of people per room. So, you know, we're not struggling with it. We're just trying to figure out how to manage it. What are some of the things that you guys might be facing? Yeah. So, um, so when when the World Health Organization issued a pandemic, um, that was close to the last day of. Uh, the semester just before they went on spring break. So they were going, the students were gonna go on spring break and then come back. And what happened was before they went on spring break, we told them you gotta take all your things with you. And we never saw them after spring break, at least live. And so um, we actually, since March, have not had any students on campus other than the international students that needed to stay. And the first time I'm gonna see them back is in on August 24th, when they come back on campus. So between March and August, we haven't seen them, but we've been planning this whole time how to have over 2,000 people 
back on campus and what that's going to look like. So they're going to have to wear masks while they're in class. They're going to have to fill every second seat. So that means the capacity that we have in the classroom is only going to be 50%. And we're working out how to put them across campus. And for myself, we're working out how to have Vespers. And so what we've done, and I think Australia helped me with um, the big camps that they have in Brisbane, is we're actually just going to purchase a huge tent and have it in the field so that we can have Vespers on Friday night together because none of the rooms could hold all the students through COVID-19. So we're looking at that. The rooms are going to have, the classrooms are going to have plexiglass for the professors so that when they teach, there's a plexiglass in front of them as well. And we're, the, the university is actually investing in this ionization technology that goes through the air conditioning system and it's gonna filter the oxygen in the room. And uh, the technology actually kills COVID-19 every 30 minutes. So not instantly, but the air is gonna be circulating. So there's top technology that we're learning about. And I think um, it's been a huge learning curve for us. Nothing prepared us for COVID-19. And so um, it's, it's just been amazing how I'm actually really proud of our campus and our students, how quickly they adjusted. Uh, we're all trying to navigate and, and figure out how to keep our people as safe as possible. Um, right. I know that some are, are struggling more so on the, the disconnection with, with others, our families. Yeah. They're, they're doing well connecting with families once again. Uh, but the, those who are elderly or those who are separated from their families or, or alone, uh, it's a real real struggle at, at this time. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, just the relational struggle that we're having. We have the technical struggle, then the relational struggle. And I think, you know, you'd think, oh, students, when they go home, all of them are going to be happy to go home. That's, you know, they're going to have an extra long spring break. And it may be true for some families, but for other students, this is actually their home away from home, this campus. And Sometimes this is the most love that they're shown here on campus. And I think it's true for church as well, that sometimes um, the love that people experience at home may be different and not the biblical version of love that they may experience in a church setting. And so um, it, wasn't, it wasn't actually exciting for all our students. Some students are facing anxiety and challenges dealing with this time. And we've had to support them from a distance uh, during this relational struggle as well, while everyone's being separated and maybe their home environment isn't the healthiest environment to be in. And though we, we have all these, you know, it's quite negative uh, mm -hmm. trying to manage some of these things and knowing some of the hurt. Well, I, I think that it's really just an exposure of what our human condition is like. Uh, here in Australia, uh, we may not have had riots or all, all sorts of things, but we have uh, had panic buying and we've had people missing out on toilet paper and it's been something uh, something so simple where we could share and yet we freak out and we're trying to preserve ourselves. And it's been a real wake-up call as to the human condition. Uh, but throughout it all, we've been able to see God working and we've been seeing the, the contrast between light and darkness, the, the beauty of surrender or self-sacrifice, uh, giving, caring, connecting. Yeah. Um, so there were definitely uh, just seeing how God moves on the heart of our students here on campus. Um, I remember just before they left campus back in March, you know, the whole, the whole senior class wasn't going to graduate. They weren't going to walk down and graduate with their friends. But what they did was they came around and dressed in their regalia and they still prayed together just before they left each other. They knew it would be the final goodbye. And just to see that, you know, you can tell a lot about where people go for strength during times of challenge. I remember someone said that character is not developed in a crisis. It's just revealed in a crisis that, you know, when, when David had to face Goliath, you just saw his strength. Uh, publicly, but he was already fighting those battles before he met Goliath. And I really saw the strength of our students spiritually as they um, went to God for strength and said, hey, we know we're in a tough time, but we're going to come together and we're going to pray together. 
during this time as well. And um, a number of our students, they kept their small groups going that they developed here on campus. They kept them going where they were and that's how they remained connected through their small group experience. And um, another challenge that was experienced, which wasn't here, but um, in New South Wales and other states as well, as you know, there was the bushfires that were happening. And one of our students who was an art major actually started um, creating uh, art of koalas and started selling them so that they could raise funds to send back to Australia to help uh, fight the fires there. So I think you're totally right. Sometimes the greatest challenge can also reveal the greatest uh, qualities that God has placed within us to face that challenge as well. So those were just some of the ways that I saw our students shine during this time. Oh, awesome. Well, and thank you, bro, for, for taking the time to, to come and bless our, our church and yeah, just to hear that the, the God is moving still. Well, he, he's always moving that you guys have your eyes wide open, ready to receive and experience his presence. Uh, we, we are looking into encouraging more small groups as well. We know the intimacy and the connection there is, is the priority over, over programming from, from our next step onwards. And yeah, just connecting people together and allowing each other to um, just to strengthen one another so that we can shine when it comes to these times where, where we're pulled onto weather to protect ourselves and preserve ourselves or to preserve life and support others. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's always a blessing to catch up with you, bro. You're, you've always been one step ahead of the game and, and been a real blessing in ministry, especially when it comes to influencing and encouraging our young people. So just want to uh, may you send our blessing from the Grove Church over to, to your church, um, to, to the community that's there at the school, and, and, of course, to your beautiful wife. Send our love over to her as well. And, yeah, we can't wait to hear the message that, that you have to share. So at this time, I invite you to pray with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you. We want to come to you just as we are. Lord, we come broken, knowing that we need healing. We need your grace. We need to know that we are unconditionally loved. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Nothing to the cross we bring, only to the cross we cling, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoy watching movies or if you enjoy watching film or if, even if you're an editor, you will know that there are times in the editing process when you will need to cut out certain scenes from the film. That's called the uncut version. The uncut version is the time where you will go through and check if the lighting is okay. If the lighting isn't okay in that scene, you may throw it out. You'll check to see if the actors have done their best in that particular scene. And if they haven't, you may cut that out because you wanna make sure when the film goes to market, you are giving the best product possible. In fact, millions of dollars are spent in the editing process to make sure that when things go to the general public, they are perfect. They are perfect. And so they go through an uncut version, and then there's the cut version. And if I was downstairs speaking to the youth and young adults, I'd ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, which version did you bring to church? Did you bring the cut version or did you bring the uncut version? Did you bring the version to church that tries to show our best and hide maybe our weaknesses or imperfections? Or did we come recognizing that we serve a God that says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Today we're going to be talking about the uncut version as it comes to the gospel. So I'll invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And as you turn your Bibles there, 
Obviously, Exodus chapter 20 comes after Exodus chapter 19. And in Exodus chapter 19, we see the people of God. They're, they're at the foothills of Mount Sinai, and God has just shown up in a powerful way. There was thunder and lightning and a sound of a trumpet, and it was undeniable that God was there. Are there times in your life when you knew that God was with you, that you knew that it could have only been God that did what He did in your life? And as they're on the foothills of those, uh, that mountain, God gives them specific instructions. Firstly, He gives them the Ten Commandments that's spoken at that time. Later on, it would be placed on tablets. And then after the commandments are give, given, He says, I want you to build me an altar an altar where the sacrifice would be laid and the, the blood of the lamb would be poured out. You see, you can't have the commandments without the blood because some people want to serve God just with the commandments but not with the blood, but you need both, amen? You need the altar of stone and the altar and or the tablets of stone that represents the commandments. You need both stones to follow God. And so he gives the instructions in Exodus chapter 20, and we'll be reading verse 24 as we look at this idea of building an altar. Firstly, he says, you shall make an altar of earth. There were two altars. One was sometimes made out of earth for me. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place, what everyone? In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. You see, God wanted them to realize that they wouldn't be able to stay at Mount Sinai forever. They're going to go through a desert. But whenever they built the altar, whatever place they built it, God would show up. Are you glad that God will show up not only at your mountains, but also in your deserts? That God will show up in every place. And some of us and all of us actually have come from every single place. And I'm not just talking geographically. Some of us have come from the place of despair. Some of us have come from the place of hurt. Some of us have come from the place of rejection. Some of us can, have come from a place where we were betrayed. But God says, if you build up an altar in that place, I will show up. I will come to you at that place. I'm so glad we serve a God that can show up in every place, not just at the mountains, but also in our deserts. Amen. And so God says, I'll show up in every place where you build an altar for me. But then he says in verse 25, but then God gives instructions as to what kind of altar he wants. Verse 25 says, if you make an altar out of stone, you shall not build it out of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. You will profane it. God gives an important promise. He says that when you make the altar, I want it uncut. And so I've got a illustration here of the, maybe the kind of rock that would have been there in the wilderness. As, as it's coming up, God will not only, we said, meet you in your mountains, but he'll also meet you in the desert. And there is a temptation that when God gives us instructions, we want to improve it. We want to improve it. God says do this, and we say we've got maybe a better idea. So thank you. This, thank you. These are our amazing SID leaders and an amazing wife. All right. So God says, I want you to choose a rock that is uncut. And this rock doesn't look like anything special, does it? looks very plain. You've seen many rocks like this before. This is a common rock. But God says, I want you to use a common rock for an uncommon purpose. And so our temptation is that when God gives us an answer to prayer, it may not come in the form we hoped. 
Have you ever prayed for something, but you said, God, I want you to answer my prayer this way. And if you bring me this, I'm going to try to improve it. Have you ever tried to improve what God has given? Have you ever tried to say, God, this isn't good enough. It's good, but I need a version 2.0. And so we grab our tools and we begin to improve. God, I, I know that you ask for a tithe of whatever comes in my increase, but I just want to improve it a little bit. God, I, I know, I know that you have given instructions as in your Ten Commandments, but maybe eight instead of ten is enough. I just want to improve it a little bit. And God says, maybe what you're praying for and your expectations of your prayer are so limited that I actually want to exceed your expectation. That what you think is common, I can use for an unexpected purpose. In fact, I have that on the screen, uh, this promise and this idea. The same God who met you, I don't think that one's it. Yes, yes, it is. Sorry, the, the same God who met you on your mountain, thank you, IT team, that met you on the mountain promises to reach you in your desert. He promises to reach you in your desert. Is it possible that as God reaches us in our desert, that we think God can't do anything in that dry place? If you've ever been to a desert, you know there's no vegetation, hardly any vegetation, hardly any water. You know in the desert place, there is, it's very barren, and some of you are coming from a barren place. Maybe your bank accounts are barren, amen? Maybe you're coming from a barren place of a relationship. Whatever it is, it's barren, and, it, and we're saying, God, can you meet me in this place? A few months ago, I had the opportunity to go to Dubai, and it was for ministry purposes. But you know that about 50 or 60 years ago in Dubai, it was just a desert. And they've been able to build skyscrapers and five-star hotels, and they've been able to cool down a desert where people come from all over the world to be there. And God is saying, in the desert place, I can meet you. In the desert place, I can find you, but the stone needs to be uncut. The stone needs to remain uncut. And God says, I can build something for you, even in a desert place. Sometimes we want to improve on what God has given us, but don't let your environment stop you from building an altar to God. Amen? Some of us are in a desert and that stopped us from doing what God wants us to do. But God is saying, don't let your environment dictate your worship to me. Build me an altar even in your desert places. But what kind of altar does he want? He wants an altar out of uncut stone, just like this. The Israelites would have brought this stone and used these kind of stones possibly to build an altar. But how are these stones formed? Well, in a desert with mountains, there would have, these stones would have been very common because in a desert, the Fahrenheit during the middle of the day can go up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And at night, it can get as low as 36 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a constant fluctuation of the temperature. And because of that fluctuation, it puts stress on the rock. And the rock begins to, the strata on the rock begins to fall. And as that strata tumbles down the mountain, it begins to break and it begins to shatter. And then you have these uncut rocks at the bottom of the mountain. Have you ever felt that there's been uncertainty in your life? through fluctuation that is causing certain things in your life to fall apart. And because of that stress, there's certain areas of our life that are tumbling down the mountain and now they've crashed and they're just sitting there and you're saying, God, what can I do with this? What can I do with my brokenness? And God says, you can use it to build an altar. You can use those broken pieces of rock 
to build an altar. Some of you, through uncertainty, have had stress. Has, have you ever met someone that's uncertain? One day they're this way, they're hot. The next day they're cold. And you think it's your fault. But it's just because they're unstable, they're uncertain. Some of you may have met an uncertain person that tells you one day they're with you and then the same day they've broken up with you. Uncertain of what they want. Uncertainty can bring stress. Uncertainty can bring stress. And sometimes that uncertainty isn't just in other people. Sometimes we become uncertain. What would happen if we just had a consistent life? What would happen if we just showed up to work on time every day and gave our best rather than maybe complaining about our work? What would happen if through uncertainty we said, God, I'm going to be more certain? Maybe for some students, imagine every single day you go to school, you say, God, I'm just thankful that I'm here at Tacoma Academy. I'm so blessed to be here and I'm going to give my best to that opportunity. And as a result of that, Maybe we will even, through that certainty, be able to do things that we never expected. Some of us are failing in our lives because of fluctuation and not sticking to something and finishing it. So many people are good at starting things, but very few people are good at finishing things. And as a result, uncertainty kicks in and we're under a lot of pressure. And so we come along once again and we try to improve what God has given. Some of us come with our uncut version and say, God, I'm not good enough. God, there's things in my life I want to change. Why did you make me like this? God, I want to change who I am. And so many people are frustrated and depressed because they're not happy with who they are. And if God says, if I wanted you to be like someone else, I would have made you like someone else. But I made you like you. Because if you don't fulfill your mission... If you don't fulfill your unique calling, if you try to be like everyone else, society and this world will suffer because God has a specific calling for you. That's why I made you this way. Don't try to improve what I've created. But you've got to put it at the altar. Maybe the reason why sometimes God doesn't meet our expectations is because he wants to exceed our expectations. Sometimes this rock isn't what we expected, but God wants to exceed it. Uh, when I was studying at Andrews University, I had the opportunity, in fact, the person that used to drive me down is sitting right there to visit my uncle in Georgia. And so we used to drive down, thank you, Alan, for all, the, uh, for all those uh, trips down. Uh, we used to drive down all the way from Andrews to Georgia, and, and while I was there, my uncle who was a professor at Southern Adventist University, would have his students come to help him in his yard. Maybe it was a good way to get a grade, I don't know. But, but that's what he used to do. I know that they loved him as well, but they were there and they would help and I would visit him. And on this particular day, he had a student there and I don't know how I ended up with a broom and they ended up with the lawnmower but we were mowing his lawn and I was sweeping the grass clippings. And the person that was mowing the lawn came to me and said, would you like to mow the lawn? And she was so pretty, her name was Christina. I said, I said I'll mow the lawn, I'll dig a hole. What do you want, girl? I'll give, you a, I'll give you a ring, girl. What do you want? I'll do anything. And so I grabbed that lawn mower and I began to mow that lawn. But I never expected that the person that I was mowing the lawn with would one day become my wife. Because God wants to exceed your expectations. If God, God, it wasn't about mowing the lawn for God, it was about introducing me to my wife. And I wonder sometimes if we minimize the things that God wants to do in our lives. Uh, Elisha was actually taking care of animals before Elijah came past. If you do the little things well, God can bless you with a lot. But because we don't like the common things, 
because we want to improve the common things, God says, I can't do anything uncommon in your life until you appreciate what I've given you. When you appreciate what I've given you, I can do much and I can build an altar, but allow God to work in your life in the little things and he can make it much. But then I never thought God wanted to exceed my expectation that the place we got married right here, Christina and I, I never thought that when we went to Australia, Pastor Tap would come to Australia a year later and then call us to Sligo Church. And I never thought the same place I would have got married in is the same place I'm preaching now. Because God wanted to exceed my expectations. I never thought that he could do that, but he, he had a bigger thing in mind for me. And I wonder sometimes if our prayers are too small and God says, don't pray the little prayer. I want to exceed your expectations in life. Don't treat it as an uncommon thing. I want to build an altar for you. God says, don't come with a cut stone, come with an uncut stone. And those stones, in essence, represent each of us. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, You also, as living stones, are built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This same word for stone in the New Testament is the same word for stone in the Septuagint. It's the same word and God is saying, you are a living stone, but you don't like who you are, so you're coming and you're trying to improve what I've created. God is saying, you are the living stone and I want you to come uncut to me. I want you to come just as you are because only when you come just as you are will I be able to build my altar. Don't try to improve what I've created. Only by allowing the lamb to come on that altar can we totally be changed by his grace. What version have we come with today? Have we come with the cut version or the uncut version to God? God doesn't need any more cut stones. He needs uncut stones. Stones that are willing to depend on Him. Stones that are realizing that we're weak, but He is strong. Stones that don't try to cover up their weaknesses, but come to God and say, God, I'm broken, but through my brokenness, build an altar out of my life. And through that, God says, when you build that kind of altar, I will be able to meet you right where you are. I wonder if God's people were able to get together and we said, God, I want to just come uncut. I'm tired of pretending. I'm, trying to, I'm tired of being something that I'm not. When we come uncut, God will say, now my power can be released upon the altar of sacrifice. It's amazing what God can do through uncut people. That's why I love Sligo, because you can come just as you are. That's why I love Sligo, because you can come uncut just as you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. You can come and uncut. And by the grace of God, we can build an altar in this place that sees the power of God unleashed in each of our lives. But we come uncut just as we are. There was a nursery rhyme that you may all know. It goes like this, and I shared it about four and a half years ago. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. You remember this, right? Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. I wonder sometimes with our broken pieces, that we try to be like the king's horses and king's men that try to put Humpty together again. And it's impossible. We can't do it. But God says, what the king's horses and what the king's men cannot do, I can do, amen. I can take the broken pieces and put it together to create an altar for me. And there's some of us that are under immense pressure because our lives are broken. And there are some things that the doctors have shared with us and it's caused us to be broken. There are some things where 
It's easy to build an altar in the home, but how do you build an altar in the hospital? As we just heard, someone's child just passed away. How do you build an altar when your child that's only a few days old has passed away? It's easy to build an altar in the home, but how do you build an altar in the hospital? It's easy to build an altar when you're walking in nature and it's a beautiful day today, but how do you build an altar when you're not walking, but you're at work and your boss doesn't appreciate what you do and no one gives you a, no, no one gives you, no one gives you a smile? How do you build an altar there? It's easy to build an altar in the comfort of our bed, but how do we build an altar in a bed of betrayal? How do you build an altar in that place? And God says, I want you to build an altar even in your desert places, even in the places that seem like they're ugly, they're deformed, they're, they're disfigured. God says, I can bring the uncut stone together and I will place my sacrifice upon that kind of altar. And I'm so glad that Jesus says, I'll place my sacrifice in an altar of my brokenness on my uncut stones. Is there anyone this morning that may have a problem that is so big for them that they feel stressed, that they feel like I can't take it anymore? In fact, I have the point here on the screen. Allow the problem to point you to your higher power. Sometimes God will give you a problem so that it can point you to a higher power, which is Him. Sometimes our stress will lead us to our Savior. Sometimes our challenge will lead us to our Christ, amen? Allow the stress and the problem to point you to your Savior. I'll finish with this final illustration. As you know, I don't like Ikea. Do you remember I shared that with you? Some of you, okay, for those that love Ikea, I don't want to offend you. But some of you know I don't like Ikea because I once ordered a bed for $495. One bed equals $495. I was a bachelor then. I was excited about my bed because I'd never owned a queen-size bed before. And I always had a bed where my legs stuck out at the end. I was excited about this bed. The bed comes from Ikea and instead of being a bed, it was a thousand pieces that made up a bed. <laughs> you know, if you've ordered anything from Ikea, you know what I'm talking about. I didn't order a thousand pieces of a bed. I ordered one bed. And sometimes life is like that. Sometimes life feels like it's a thousand pieces and God says, who said, I'm gonna give you something that is complete and finished. Faith is a process. Faith is a process. It will take time. You'll have to bring one rock here and run rock here. It looks unbroken, but you're putting it together and it will make an altar and God can take your broken pieces and turn it into a masterpiece and allow his sa the Savior of the world to come on that altar and through His power, through His grace, the altar becomes a place of worship. My prayer this morning is that you will be able to create an altar out of your broken pieces because when you dedicate it to God, He says He'll meet you in that place. That is my prayer. Amen. Thank you for sharing that story about Jesus. See you next time and have a great week. I'll see.